Today's episode is sponsored by Ridge. If you've ever thought about upgrading your wallet game and having a shot at a thrilling new ride, well, you're in for a treat because this is your chance to score big in Ridge's third annual summer sweepstakes, brought to you in collaboration with the legends over at Hennessy. So look at this beauty. This is the Ridge wallet. It holds up to 12 cards and cash. I've got just a couple of cards in there and my driver's license because I'm a normal person. I don't have like 11 cards. <laughs> plus a driver's license. Now, I don't know, maybe you got a library card, whatever. Look, people have lots of cards, just not me. I don't know. But uh, it's all still very neat, very tidy. It's about as big as a, slimmer than a cell phone, really. And also, on the back here, that's uh, the AirTag holder, because I uh, constantly lose my wallet. Or it's not like losing it permanently, it's just somewhere in the house. And I'm like, where is it? Where is it? I use my phone, it goes beep, and then I'm ready to leave, which is perfect. They got 30 colors and stars. This is the burnt titanium one, which I love. I've also got a carbon fiber one. And they've even got forged ember, burnt Damascus, plus RFID blocking, so no digital pickpockets getting at your stuff. Then also, there is the key case. My work keys are on here. This is actually the carbon fiber one, although you can get the burnt titanium to match. My work keys go on here. It's like a Swiss army knife for keys. You just like, boom, outside. Top lock, bottom lock, and that is my post box. One to six keys you could store on here, no jangling. Plus, if you buy the key case and the wallet, you could save up to 30%. Then also got to tell you, Ridge is teaming up with Hennessy for the sweepstakes of a lifetime. Imagine rolling around in a new Hennessy Ford Bronco Velociraptor or with $75,000 in cash. It's your choice. And hey, here's the scoop. By entering on their website, you're in the running. No money needed, but it gets better. For every dollar you spend on the site, you get a bonus entry. And if you go big with a bit of custom Hennessy gear, like this beautiful wallet here, you could score up to a thousand extra entries. Plus, when you use my link, ridge.com slash shadows, you'll get 10 bonus entries at checkout, plus 10% off. Just use the code shadows. Brilliant. Thank you, Ridge, for sponsoring. And now today's video. Hawaii is the closest thing you'll find to paradise on Earth. A tropical archipelago whose incredible beaches, lush rainforests, and active volcanoes have captured the world's imagination. It's a booming tourist destination, an intersection of luxury and exuberant culture. It's the perfect honeymoon spot, the perfect getaway, the perfect snowbird destination or retirement home. In all the world, there's nowhere quite like it. Except, well, that's a hell of a whitewashing, and it omits both a history and a present-day situation marked by foreign expansionism, cultural genocide, and the continued exploitation of the islands by not only the tourist industry, but by the United States as a whole. In this exploration of the dark and often brutal history of the Hawaiian Islands, we're going to uncover the devastating effects of European arrival, the many decades of colonization, the overthrow of a legitimate Hawaiian ruling government, and the many ramifications of Hawaii's history that still impact it today. The first people to reach Hawaii arrived by boat, probably sometime between the year 300 CE and 1000 CE. It's a broad timeline, but necessarily so. Like the inhabitants of many Polynesian islands, Hawaii's early settlers kept oral histories and traditions rather than written ones. As one would expect, this creates some blank spots within the historical record, especially when considering how many generations uh, would have passed by the time Europeans arrived to the island. Most likely, the first arrivals came from the Marquesas Islands, 2,000 miles south of the archipelago. When they arrived, they found a set of islands devoid of predators and disease, and by all indications of archaeological study, no prior residents. The society these first islanders built, as well as later arrivals from Tahiti, was both constrained by and enhanced by the unique conditions of Hawaii. A lack of metal clay and large animals made for a very different sort of cultural progression than was seen in many other parts of the world. But Hawaii nonetheless developed into a highly advanced society given their resources. From technological advancements like massive seafaring canoes and land and water management systems to scientific ones like a sophisticated calendar system and highly developed navigational techniques, Hawaii civilization was dictated by its resources and its needs. So too was its culture, an elaborate and deeply religious caste system which, which chieftains and their bloodlines ruled various islands in a completely interrelated system, often including inter-island wars and marriage-based political alliances. The islands and their feudal culture were totally self-sufficient, with no known contact with the outside world at the time. 
There's some evidence that Spain may have run trade routes in the area for several centuries, but Spain never made a territorial claim to Hawaii, probably to protect the secret locations of said trade routes. But that all changed in 1778, when the British explorer and naval officer Captain James Cook arrived at the islands on the ship's discovery and resolution. Cook and his crew had been in the process of mapping the Pacific, but had encountered Hawaii by chance. In this first encounter, Cook made a fairly major impression on the people of Hawaii, and he did this in more ways than one. His crew's early skirmishes with Hawaiian warriors, including one Hawaiian's death and their use of fireworks as a show of force, led the locals to believe that the new arrivals were sent or allied with the deity Lonomakua, also known as the Keeper of Fire. This assessment led the elders on the island that Cook had arrived on to conclude that Cook and his crew should be appeased and befriended via trade. Cook left the islands not long after arriving, but returned later that same year, and again in 1779. By then, Cook was well known to the people of Hawaii and had related many of his experiences to people in Europe who would later document and publish information on the archipelago and how to get there. But in 1779, Hawaiian priests and elders had formed their best understanding of how Cook fit in with their religion, and various local chiefs had worked Cook into their own political machinations. In his third visit to the islands, Cook was initially well received, with his presence being honored and celebrated for the month that he and his crew were present. But after his departure, Cook's ships were damaged in a storm, which forced them to return, an action which violated the Hawaiians' understanding of his comings and goings, as well as the meaning behind them. Tension grew as Cook's crew tried to repair their ships, until the theft of the Discovery's small support boat led Cook to attempt to take the king of the Hawaiian Big Island, Kale Upu'u, as his hostage until the boat was returned. The situation devolved quickly and was only made worse by news that elsewhere on the islands, Cook's men had shot and killed another local chieftain. Cook and four of his men were killed, along with one Hawaiian warrior. His successor was able to restore order and achieve a graceful exit from the situation, but the damage was done. After his death, further tales of Cook's escapades were published in Europe, and this led to further visits from Europeans and Americans, including explorers, traders, and whalers. With their continued presence, the islands were exposed to the wider world in a second way, one that we now know was a hallmark of first contact experiences between Europeans and peoples of the New World. Diseases like influenza and smallpox ravaged the Hawaiian Islands in short order, causing a massive decline in the local population. Within two years of Cook's arrival, some 1 in 17 native Hawaiians had already died, and by the 20-year mark, nearly half of the island's population had perished. The native Hawaiian population declined to just 16% of its pre-arrival numbers by the year 1840. In the following years, European arrival had a major effect not just on Hawaiian mortality rates, but Hawaiian society and government. The Europeans' weapons were a game-changer for Hawaii's centuries of inter-island warfare, and Wang Yun warrior in particular. The Big Island King's nephew, Kamehameha, used the situation better than anyone else on the islands. Kamehameha oversaw an acquisitions process that transferred European armaments into his uncle's hands and led a conquest of each of the Big Island's tribes, thus gathering the manpower to wage war across the archipelago. During this time, Kamehameha rose to the mantle of king himself, becoming King Kamehameha I. Once Kamehameha consolidated power on the Big Island, he used his thousands of warriors and his European advisors to build the largest army Hawaii had ever seen at that time. The islands of Maui fell in short order, and both Kamehameha and the rival king of Oahu, who controlled the rest of the island chain, leveraged European artillery for their final confrontation. For Kamehameha, this had come at a severe cost. He had promised the Big Island to Great Britain in exchange for help and recognition on the rest of the archipelago. But infighting among his rivals helped to ensure that Kamehameha's decision would not be in vain, and with fire and steel on his side, Kamehameha took Oahu in 1795. Before long, the rest of the islands fell under Kamehameha's control. Less than 35 years after the arrival of the Europeans, Hawaii and the lives of Hawaiians had been inexorably changed. Kamehameha unified the islands under the Kingdom of Hawaii, which would rule the islands for the following 85 years. But this regime was far less an affirmation of Hawaiian autonomy than it was an overseer to decades of sweeping and often unpredictable change. 
By this time, Captain George Vancouver and his crew had introduced livestock to the islands, which quickly bred out of control and destroyed the well-established ecosystem. Given its location in the middle of the Pacific, Hawaii also quickly became a way station for traders and whalers, and within a decade of the Kingdom of Hawaii being established, the first Christian missionaries arrived to the islands from New England. This coincided with a number of cultural changes within the Hawaiian system, instituted by the Queen Regent Ka'ahumanu after the death of Kamehameha I. Ka'ahumanu was instrumental in pushing out the Kapu system, an elaborate system of Hawaiian rules, codes, and conducts, as well as social norms. In their place, she welcomed Protestant Christianity and encouraged Hawaiians to be baptized, using a new legal model structured on the Ten Commandments and other Christian values to replace the previous system. Ka'ahumanu also banned the practice of hula dancing and established diplomatic relations with the United States. This wide range of social and political reforms significantly boosted the efforts of Christian missionaries and greatly expanded American influence on the island's trade, but also brought the islands and their people much more firmly under foreign control and overwrote massive portions of Hawaiian culture. This change led to white settlers being able to exert significant influence over Hawaii, both in terms of the assets they leveraged by trade and their position as religious authorities on the practice of Christianity. They used that influence in a number of ways, but the most significant during this time was to convince King Kamehameha III, the ruler at the time, to adopt both a constitution that was to their liking and the Great Mahali, an act of land division that reshaped Hawaii completely. The concept of private land ownership did not exist in the Hawaiian Islands prior to this, and a Bill of Rights of the Hawaiian Islands had guaranteed less than a decade previously that Hawaii's lands would not be taken from its people. But in 1848, the Great Mahale divided the islands of the archipelago between the king and 245 prominent Hawaiians. This meant that land was now owned, titled, and most importantly, it could be bought. And, well, who had the wealth, power, and influence to claim the most valuable lands? Well, that of course would be the white settlers, who made it quite clear that they cared less about Kamehameha III's authority over the system and more about their ability to use it to their advantage. Hawaii's people would receive less than 1% of the land in reality, despite being promised 33%. Over the mid-19th century, the United States began to form more of a controlling stake over foreign influence within Hawaii, beating out British and French claims by virtue of somewhat better relations and an obvious geographical advantage. This culminated in the signing of the Reciprocity Treaty of 1875 between the Kingdom of Hawaii and the United States, which gave Hawaii duty-free and complete access to the U.S. sugar market and other subsets of the economy. This helped to bring down the price of sugar in the U.S. after it had risen dramatically during the American Civil War. In exchange, the U.S. received special economic privileges in Hawaii, as well as exclusive rights to Pearl Harbor, which were included in an amendment to the agreement a decade later. In retrospect, the treaty was an extremely effective way to turn Hawaii into one massive sugar plantation. And we do mean just one, with San Francisco sugar refiner Klaus Spreckels claiming a monopoly by 1882. But plantation production also saw a much wider diversification of Hawaii's foreign population, with significant numbers of Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, and Filipino immigrants arriving in these years. The king at this time, Kalakaua, had been an advocate for the Reciprocity Treaty, seeing it as a way to expand Hawaii's coffers while maintaining a degree of autonomy in the face of a foreign market takeover. But Kalakaua's other acts during this time got him into trouble with the Hawaiian elite, including his efforts to return Hawaiian culture and customs to the people than the large amounts of spending from his administration, including on a modern palace and a trip to circumnavigate the globe. In response, the elites, for the most part wealthy Americans and Europeans, forced the signature of what's now known as the Bayonet Constitution, a highly restrictive agreement that Kalakaua signed at a bayonet point. With its signature, the Hawaiian monarchy conceded most of its power to a legislature operating in the interest of the settler class, while also establishing a voting system linked to property ownership, again, which was controlled by those same settlers. The Bayonet Constitution started a countdown till death for the monarchy, a death that King Kalakaua himself would not witness. 
1891, his heir and sister, Queen Liliokalani, became the first reigning queen of Hawaii. Unlike her brother, Liliokalani did not consent her role as a facilitator to Hawaii's economic occupation and publicly opposed the terms of the Reciprocity Treaty. Kalakaua's reintroduction of Hawaiian cultural practice had deeply pissed off its Christian settlers and missionary class, but that had at least been an acceptable imposition. Liliokalani, however, uh, was taking far more drastic measures which would mark her as a threat to Hawaii's real ruling order. On January the 14th, 1893, the Queen drafted a constitution that was meant to counter and undo the effects of the Bayonet Constitution, which was strongly opposed by most surviving Hawaiian natives. At this time, the American McKinley Act had just nullified Hawaii's advantage in the U.S. sugar trade by removing import duties from Hawaii's competitor nations, adding pressure on the sugar elites of Hawaii to maintain and expand production. Liliokalani's constitution uh, would have made this effort functionally impossible, and in response, a small group of Europeans and Americans formed the Committee of safety, a conspiracy to overthrow the Queen and seek annexation to the U.S. The coup's leaders included Lauren Thurston, a newspaper publisher, and Henry Cooper, an American lawyer. Two days after the Queen's constitution was drafted, the Marshal of the Kingdom of Hawaii got word of the coup, but his requests to prevent it by force were denied by the Queen's cabinet over fears of escalating tensions with the United States. After a failed attempt at negotiation with the conspirators, the Marshal mustered a force of some 500 men to defend the Queen, causing the conspirators to swell their own ranks. On January the 17th, amidst a standoff outside the royal palace, Henry Cooper announced the deposition of the Queen, the abolishment of the monarchy, and the establishment of a provisional government. Still fearing the development of a larger conflict, the Queen's defenders did not retaliate forcefully to Cooper's proclamation. The USS Boston, a naval cruiser from the United States, had sent troops ashore on the 16th to keep the peace, and their presence forced the Queen and her government to accept the Queen's placement under house arrest at the royal palace. The Queen directed her forces to surrender. In her own words, summarized in a later autobiography, Since the troops of the United States had been landed to support the revolutionists by order of the American minister, it would be impossible for us to make any resistance. This reality posed a major problem for the United States, including President Grover Cleveland, who denounced the USS Boston's participation in the coup as an act of war that the United States had now unwillingly committed. Cleveland recognized that the people of Hawaii had no desire for an armed force of U.S. troops imposing foreign will on their soil, and publicly admitted that the actions of the Marines and the sailors in Hawaii were wrongful in their nature. As such, the United States did not immediately annex Hawaii, despite the wishes of Thurston and his gang of conspirators. Instead, their provisional government went into effect under the command of new President Sanford Dole. The new government, known as the Republic of Hawaii, was a public and shameless oligarchy, emboldened by the presence of a settler's militia known as the Honolulu Rifles. The Queen, who survived her deposition, issued a scathing statement to protest her overthrow, even as she acknowledged that she would yield. Lilio Kalani's intent was instead to address the US government directly, something that Grover Cleveland's administration was happy to facilitate. A government investigation found that United States diplomatic and military representatives had abused their authority and were responsible for the change in government. The Americans who had aided in the overthrow were punished, and Cleveland himself made verbal commitments to restore the status quo that had existed prior to the coup, including the monarchy itself. However, as you can probably guess, President Dole and the Republic of Hawaii refused Cleveland's demands to reinstate the Queen outright. A counter-report from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where most members were pro-annexation of Hawaii, disputed the first report's claims and gave the Republic of Hawaii enough of a buffer in Washington that President Cleveland couldn't take action. In 1895, a group of pro-monarchy conspirators led by several of the Queen's loyalists made one last attempt to reinstate the Queen. In a short counter-revolution, some 500 poorly armed recruits waged three skirmishes against Republic of Hawaii troops, and despite minimal loss of life on both sides, the revolutionaries were routed, captured, or driven to desertion. Many of the participants would face severe consequences later, and when a weapons cache was found and directly blamed on the Queen, she was arrested on charges of treason. To prevent further violence, Lilio Kalani renounced all claims to the throne, and after signing a formal statement of abdication, she was able to secure the pardons of many of her supporters. Lilio Kalani continued to oppose annexation for the next few years, but after the end of the Cleveland administration, a resistance dried up in Washington. Cleveland's successor, President William McKinley, was much more amenable to the idea of American expansionism, and under his leadership, the U.S. Congress passed the Newlands Resolution. In 1898, the Republic of Hawaii was annexed as a U.S. territory at a public ceremony at the Royal Palace. 
Hardly any native Hawaiians chose to attend the event, and those few who did did so in protest on behalf of the 40,000 native Hawaiians whose families had been lucky enough to survive the last century of occupation. Across the islands, Hawaiian natives protested annexation till the end, as did the former Hawaiian royal family. Sanford Dole, former president of the Republic of Hawaii, was made the territory's first governor. The sovereign nation of Hawaii ceased to exist, never to be seen again. In the century to follow, Hawaii would be maintained as a plantation territory, with significant impositions on civil liberties during World War II, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, itself a target within Hawaii. The territory achieved U.S. statehood in 1959, and though a sovereignty movement has gained limited recognition during this time, it has not come anywhere close to reaffirming Hawaiian sovereignty outright. Hawaii still lives with the ramifications of its difficult history. Native Hawaiians have had far more trouble than continental Native Americans in gaining rights and autonomy, especially where land rights are concerned. The effects of the Great Mahale still exist to this day, with the US government and a small handful of families controlling massive amounts of land compared to the local population, and the US military maintains a strong presence there. Locals and the Hawaiian government continued to plead with tourists to slow down the rates of their visits, with many native Hawaiians advocating official protections against tourist exploitation of Hawaii's fragile landscape. Animals like rats and mongoose introduced by European settlers continue to distort Hawaii's ecology, and as of now, debate still rages over the use of Hawaiian ancestral lands for anything from the 30-meter telescope on Mauna Kea to condos, hotels, and other developments. It goes without saying that the Hawaiian Islands today are a far cry from what they were prior to the arrival of Captain James Cook. But it's far more important to stress not just how different the islands are, but why and how that change took place. The archipelago is by no means unique. History has seen thousands of sovereign lands and peoples colonized by foreigners, ravaged by disease, and eventually brought under the yoke of a more powerful neighbor. This, unfortunately, has been just as much a part of human history as anything else, and most states around the world continue to reckon with the implications either as a formerly colonizing nation or as a formerly colonized one. Mm-hmm.